All right, so we are going to discuss a very important topic right now. All of these topics are well represented in exams. So let's get started uh, again on the subject of biological membranes. We're going to talk about what can go in and out of the membrane as it pleases and the forms of transport of different species across the membrane. So let's get started. Let's get started. If this is my bilipid layer, what can go through it uh, by itself? What can go through it? Because we know that things go in and out. We know from thermodynamics that biological systems are open, so matter goes through. So what can go through? Well, it just so happens that if you're a relatively small or you're a, an uncharged or a nonpolar nonpolar molecule, you will be able to go through, oh well, by yourself, easily. You are not going to need a hand going in and going out. You can do it all on your own, which is just like CO2, O2, and uh, uh, nitrogen gas as well, all these gases. And if you're wondering, uh, does uh, carbon dioxide not have a, a dipole moment? It does not. This is, this is its, this is its, structure here if we're looking at a Lewis structure. So this is orientation, it's linear, so it's not it's not polar. And if you if you're flipping this around and you're saying if I'm a large molecule and I'm charged or I'm charged or let's say I'm polar, what do I do? What do I do? Well it just so happens that uh, let's just say glucose, glucose, a large molecule, we can take a charged ion like like potassium or like sodium. These guys can't go in and out as they please. And we do know that glucose is uptaken by cells. So we must have a mechanism, a way of getting these guys through. So we're going to discuss different types of diffusion across this layer. Perfect. So let's get to it. And we're going to first start with passive diffusions. And in passive diffusions, always think, always think, high concentration, high concentration to low concentration. That is the essence of passive diffusion. That's the idea. So if I have these, let's just say I have diatomic oxygen, it can just passively and freely, freely go through. It doesn't need a hand going through from outside of the cell, from outside of the cell, inside to the inside of the cell. And if I have, let's just say I have carbon dioxide. It also can just fuse freely outside, outside of the cell. It doesn't need a hand. It can freely fuse and it also doesn't require energy as you can imagine. Very nice. And we also have a concept called facilitated diffusion. Let's just say I have one of the molecules that is either charged or is larger or has some sort of dipole moment and it can't fuse freely on its own, then I can have carrier molecules. I can have carrier molecules or carrier proteins. This carrier proteins, what it does is basically it binds to one of these, let's say, charged species outside of the membrane. It binds to it. It houses it. It goes through a conformation or change and it releases it to the intracellular space. And this is basically also from point of high concentration to low concentration. This is still a form of passive diffusion. And we also have uh, channel forming proteins, which is basically opening the door that these guys can go through. So this is facilitated diffusion, also passive, also passive. What it means is high concentration to low concentration. Thank you, Wikipedia, for this. Uh, with this nice depiction. And we're going to keep on going and with the spirit of passive diffusion, with the spirit of passive diffusion, where are we now? We're on active, active mechanisms. All right. So what I would like to discuss now, we're going to get to active mechanisms. What I'd like to discuss now is ionophores. And you can think of ionophores as, I'm just going to write it here. I'm only going to give you what you need because it is also in the minimals and I'm going to give you the same the same question that was asked in a relation, a relation analysis. Ionophores are lipid soluble, lipid soluble molecules that can facilitate, they can facilitate uh, ions across the lipid bilayer. And we know that ions, 
ions cannot go through because they're charged. They cannot go through on their own. So we have two types of ionophores. Let's just say I have a charge floating around and that charge really wants to go in. This is the intra intracellular and this is the extracellular. Extracellular. So I'm going to have this ionophore here. This is the ionophore. And basically if you're wondering how it looks chemically, it's just, just a macrocyclic molecule. It's just a big, big ring. And that ring can just basically go around, go around this molecule. This molecule just jumps, or rather this ion just jumps into this molecule and binds inside of it. It binds to the inside of it. And now this, this ionophore can just carry the molecule through. It, it can just carry the molecule through, through the bilayer and inside because the ionophore is lipid soluble. The ionophore can go in and out as it pleases. So this is one type of ionophore and this is called a carrier, carrier ionophore. And the other type of ionophore can form a channel here, can form a channel here and have some sort of hydro, uh, hydrophilic parts inside of it that allow this guy to just go right through, to just go right through. And this is called a channel forming, channel forming, there's no need for parentheses, channel forming ionophore. This is a channel forming and this is a carrier ionophore. Perfect. And what we need to know about ionophores is that the plan for the lipid bilayer, the plan is not to let these guys through. And ionophores are like kind of messing around with that plan. They're kind of disrupting it. So in that sense, they have antibiotic properties. I'm just going to write it here. Anti, antibiotic properties. And one of the statements and inhalation analysis question from the second self-control in 2011 that I remember, one of, one of the statements was ionophores are associated with antibiotic properties. And the answer is yes, 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 they are. So this is ionophores. And ionophores, just as a reminder, are passive, passive forms of diffusion because they take ions from place of high concentration to place of relative low concentration. Perfect. And we're going to keep on going with the spirit of things and talk about the active diffusion. And whenever you're saying active, whenever you're saying active, what you need to bear in mind is from low concentration, low concentration to high concentration. This is, this is the essence of active active diffusion and also what you need to bear in mind is at expense expense of energy so if you have any form of open essay question or in the labs in your lab exam they ask you what is the idea of active diffusion what is its characteristic well active diffusion pumps species from low concentration to high concentration and because it is going against against the gradient, the chemical gradient, it would do so at the expense of energy. And the way that the pumps do that, we're going to get to those in a second, is by hydrolyzing, hydrolyzing ATP. And if you haven't gotten to that in chemistry just yet, we have adenosine triphosphate that we can use. It stores energy in its bonds. We can use it to liberate energy. And that's the energy that we use. Perfect. <laughs> so let's, let's give an example here. We have the sodium potassium pump also brought to us by Wikipedia. And what happens here, what happens here is that we have sodium. We have a lot of sodium outside, outside of the cell. We have a lot of sodium outside of the cell. And what we're doing is we're taking three sodiums. We're taking three sodiums and we're pumping them out, out of the cell, out of the cell even though there are still lots of sodiums out of the cell. So we're taking them from low concentration, there are only a few here, to a place of very high concentration. So it would require energy. And what it also does is after it takes three potassiums out, it takes two, two, sorry, it puts three sodiums out. I sometimes get those confused. So it pumps three sodiums out. It pumps back in two potassiums inside, inside the cell. Let's just say 
inside, no, inside the cell is okay. Inside the cell. And we know we have plenty, plenty of, plenty of, what am I going to use for, for potassium? We have plenty of potassium inside the cell. We already have plenty of potassium. So by bringing in two potassiums, we're going against the chemical gradient because we're going from low potassium concentration to high potassium concentration. So we're going to need energy. So this, this is how we can hydrolyze ATP, and this is ATP, and this is how it's hydrolyzed. We can hydrolyze ATP to kick out three, three sodiums and bring back in two potassiums. And the idea, the idea of taking out three positive charges and bringing in two positive charges will leave us with a net of negative one charges negative one charges because I'm only I'm only getting two for three that I'm losing this property is called electrogenic so it is an electrogenic pump it is an electrogenic pump because it it, it promotes some sort of charge difference across the membrane there you go and also what it does is that it it uh, generates energy or it's responsible for what's propelling what I can sell I'll just write propelling, but because it's not direct energy, it propels propels the secondary the secondary diffusion mechanism. So essentially, what it's doing is it's creating it's creating chemical gradient. It's creating an environment with lots of sodium, creating an environment with lots of sodium, and an environment rich with potassium. And these guys can't wait to get to the other side, only they can't, they can't. And there's a lot of potassium, and you can imagine that if suddenly I broke the layer here, let's just say that the layer broke here, we can expect all of this, all of this sodium to rush in and all the potassium to rush out. And this is actually a mechanism that is going to be discussed not breaking the layer, but allowing these to flow through. We're going to get to that later. But for now, we have left yet to discuss the secondary diffusion mechanism, which is pretty simple. And being that I don't really like the images for secondary active used in the presentation uh, from Wikipedia, I'm going to give you another example. Let's just say that I have a bunch of friends. I have a bunch of friends, and they're staying at my house. Or let's just say, I have a bunch of friends and they're all in Israel with me. And they're all happy because Israel is sunny and Debrecen is so, so cold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell them, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to treat you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you overseas. I'm going to send you to a ski trip, uh, a ski trip to escape all this nice sunny weather. So I'm going to essentially buy them tickets for a one-month vacation. So I'm just going to... I'm just going to move them all out. I'm going to buy them those tickets. But I'm going to tell them, you can only come back. You can only come back if you bring me Toblerones. So each of you need to bring me a Toblerone when you come back. Otherwise, I wouldn't let you through customs for whatever reason. So now I have a bunch of people abroad. Let me just eliminate all these lines. Let me just eliminate all these lines. So all these guys, all these guys left the country. And now I have a bunch a bunch of Israelis, a bunch of Israelis that are outside of the country. They're all outside for, for visiting for a month of ski vacation. And now they really want to come back because they're homesick. But in order to come back, they have to give me Toblerones. So each of them is going to be carrying a Toblerone to cross the border because otherwise I would not let them in. And that way, as they come to Israel, as they come back home, I'm sitting at home, I'm bored, maybe I'm a little hungry. Now, being that they brought all their Toblerones, and I didn't have any Toblerones to begin with, now I have a pack of Toblerones. Basically, what I'm saying is, I can, use, I can use the idea that I have a lot of people that can't wait to come back home, they really want to come back home, and I can use them to bring some, something else with them. And if you think about it, if you think about it, I have my bilipid layer, this is my bilipid layer, and I already know that my pump put out a lot of sodiums, sorry, potassium, no, sodiums, I was right. So it put out a lot of sodiums, a lot of sodiums. And those sodiums, those sodiums can't really, can't really get in, although they really want to because, because the gradient propels them to come in. There's a high concentration here, 
and a low concentration here because of the pump. If this is the pump, keeps pumping them out, keeps pumping them out. So they really want to come in. Only they can't come in because they can't go through. But if I have a border check and I'm saying, hey, hey, sodiums, you can come in if you bring with you this big glucose molecule that can't really that can't really come through. You can only come if you bring one of those with you. And that way, I can have a situation in which glucose would just go right in and they tag along this, or rather, sodiums are going to go in, but they're going to bring this glucose with them. So the glucose is riding on this, on this chemical, chemical gradient that was generated with the pump. So this is secondary active. And why is this secondary active? It doesn't use ATP or energy per se, but it uses the energy stored in the chemical gradient that was generated from the pump that does use ATP. What I mean is, if for some reasons I run out of ATP, there's no more ATP, and all of these guys, all of these um, sodiums are coming in because they're bringing their friends with them, and I told them that they can, and the pump is not pumping them out anymore because I'm out of ATP, I'm going to run out of gradient. It's not going to be low or high concentration. It's going to be the same. So, in effect, sodiums are not going to want to come in anymore. And that is why it is secondary active, because it does indirectly use energy. And if for some reason I run out of energy, these secondary active mechanisms would also shut down. Hopefully you found this helpful. You just need to, to remember active at expense of energy. Uh, passive uh, free diffusion does not require energy. And you need to understand the differences. And it is also a good idea understanding the ratio because you're going to have to remember it. The ratio of three, three sodiums going out to the ratio of two potassiums coming in. And we'll discuss that later. Hopefully you found this helpful. See you in the next video.